Back in 1983, uh, off the California coast, there was a storm, and went 25 to 30 foot seas. And so we started heading in. And all of a sudden we fell off a 30 footer that fast. And we just slid right off. I looked up and there was the next one. And it came right down on top of us. I was in the bow, it catapulted me into the sea, and I was just tumbled and tossed like a rag doll. You can only hold your breath so long. About how long were you in the water? Yeah, the, the crew that were looking for me said I was there from anywhere from 15 to 18 minutes under, this, under the water. 15 to 18 minutes. Yeah. So you have 15 to 18 minutes without a breath of air. Right. You may be wondering what a video entitled Jesus in India has to do with near-death experiences. When the topic of Jesus traveling to India comes up, it's almost entirely about his travels in his youth before starting his ministry. But what if his travels took place later on, after the attempted crucifixion? What was his true mission? Did Jesus preach that he was the literal Son of God? When you look past erroneous Pauline beliefs, you begin to establish who Jesus of Nazareth really was. As Jesus stated, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. A prophet of God, a humble man who was persecuted by his own people and ultimately handed down the punishment of crucifixion. In 1899, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, an individual who claimed to be the awaited Latter-day Messiah, wrote a book entitled Jesus in India. It detailed Jesus' survival from the cross and the latter part of his life. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wrote that Jesus was in a coma on the cross, having suffered a near-death experience. Having survived the crucifixion, he was taken down, unconscious, from the cross after only a few hours, with the help of Joseph of Armithia and Nicodemus, who applied an ointment, a mixture of aloe and mirrors, on his body to heal his wounds. Jesus fully recovered in the tomb. This solidifies the prophetic sign Jesus gave prior to the crucifixion. A wicked and adulterous generation demands a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In regards to this prophecy, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wrote, It is obvious that Jonah did not die in the belly of the whale. All that happened was that he went into a swoon or a coma. The holy books of God bear witness that Jonah, by the grace of God, remained in the belly of the whale alive, came out alive, and his people ultimately accepted him. If then Jesus had died in the belly of the whale, what resemblance could there be between the dead and the living, and vice versa? After leaving his tomb fully conscious and healed from his wounds, Jesus met his disciples, who thinking he was a ghost, were shocked to see him standing before them. He showed them his healed wounds from which they could see nails had been driven through. Around 40 days later, According to Christian beliefs, Jesus ascended to heaven. If Jesus did not die on the cross, though, he was never resurrected, nor did he ascend to heaven. So what happened to Jesus if he survived? According to the Bible, the Hebrew tribes were named after the sons or grandsons of Jacob, whose title was Israel, which means the soldier of God. Isra means soldier and Il means God. So the Hebrew people came to be known as Israelites, the children of Israel. Jacob's first wife, Leah, bore six sons, Reuben, Simeon, 
Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zubalon. Each son was the father of a tribe and received tribal land of their own except Levi. Levi's descendants, who were priests and temple functionaries, were dispersed amongst other tribes and received no land of their own. Prophets Moses and Aaron were also among the descendants of Levi. Two other tribes, Gad and Asher, were named after sons born to Jacob and Zilpah, Leah's maidservant. Two additional tribes, Dan and Naphtali, were named after sons of Jacob born to Bilhah, the maidservant of Rachel, Jacob's second wife. Rachel bore him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin provided Israel with its first king, Saul, and was later assimilated into the tribe of Judah. While no tribe bore the name of Joseph, two tribes were named after his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. After the exodus from Egypt, ten tribes under the leadership of Joshua took possession of Canaan, the promised land. This land was divided amongst the twelve tribes. King Saul governed them for some time, and then was succeeded by King David who established the capital at Jerusalem. King David was followed by his son Solomon, who built the famous temple dedicated to Yahweh, and around 930 BC the kingdom eventually split into two. Judah and Benjamin occupied the south, while the remaining ten tribes occupied the north and east bank of Jordan and in history they eventually became known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. The Bible refers to these tribes as the Lost Sheep of Israel. The Kingdom of Judah and the Kingdom of Israel were hostile towards each other. Following the conquest of the Northern Kingdom 721 BC, it fell under the Assyrians and per Assyrian custom, they began to transport the conquered people, the tribes of Israel, to other parts of the Syrian Empire. A century and a half later, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia took over and destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. Then Cyrus captured Babylon and he issued a proclamation which allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. But only a small number of them went back, and most never returned to their own country. But rather they journeyed further east the ten tribes were gradually assimilated by other people and thus disappeared from history. Nevertheless, a belief persisted that one day these lost tribes would be found. In the time of Jesus, only two of the tribes were in the region where he preached. The second century historian Josephus wrote in his book Antiquities of the Jews, that the ten tribes were beyond Euphrates in his time, east of present-day Iraq and in the Persian Empire which extended into India. The mission of Jesus was to reach out to the lost tribes or sheep of Israel, as stated in Matthew 15.24. It was thus imperative for him to migrate to the east. One of the major caravan routes out of Palestine was through Galilee where Jesus visited his disciples in hiding, to Syria through the Fertile Crescent and to the east. His first stop was Damascus, and it is evident that it was on the road to Damascus that Jesus confronted Saul of Tarsus, a prominent persecutor of Christians, who later became the Apostle Paul. In the book Jesus in India, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed says that starting his journey from Jerusalem, and passing through Nasibas and Iran, Jesus is shown to have reached Afghanistan, where he met the Jews who had settled after their escape from the bonds of Nebuchadnezzar. The mass of evidence showing that the people of Afghanistan, northwest India, particularly Kashmir and neighboring areas are of Israelite ancestry, continues to grow. Their physical features, their language, folklore, their customs, their festivals, all attest to their Israelite heritage. Evidence also comes from the names they give to their villages and the monuments and ancient historical works. I'm going to read for you today, tonight, from this uh, wonderful book again on the tribes of Israel. 
Um, there are testaments from mouths of people who met those amazing people, forgotten people. So this is a testament from a wise person named Chacham Yosef Eliyahu. And they live in a city named Balach. Sometimes he was coming to a place named Kabul that is in Afghanistan and also made some deals and business in the city Mazar. He was a rabbi in Harat and also in Kabul. And he wrote in his scripts that they are around 1,500 people, women working in the fields, and the men, they are not, uh, they don't have a specific way of slaughtering their animals, except for by the re Muslim religion, but they don't do more than that. But when they pray, they say, Musa Nabi Allah. Moses is the prophet of God. And this is something that the Muslims usually will not say, just probably. I mean, I don't know the Muslims' uh, culture enough, but uh, I assume that he's mentioning it because it's important to mention, probably because it's different than the rest of the Muslim people in that area, that they will for sure will mention the Muhammad, Muhammad as the main prophet and not Moses as the main prophet. And they fast one day a year and it's a memory for Yom Kippur. For our day of fast, Yom Kippur, 10 days after Rosh Hashanah. So they have a day of fast in that date as well. Following this, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed says that from Afghanistan, Jesus went to Kashmir where some Israelite tribes had also settled. He made this place his home. It is also notable that early church history documents the existence of a gospel in the Hebrew language found in India, which also confirms Israelites settled there. Saint Jerome of around 400 AD wrote that the scholar Pantanus in the second century came across the document in his travels. St. Jerome further wrote that the Israelites in his time continued to live in the Persian Empire. Some pilot genetic studies on people in India who to this day call themselves Bani Israel or the children of Israel confirm their Middle Eastern origin. There are many correlations about the similarities between Hebrew people and the people of Kashmir. The linguistic similarities, which are very strong, types of foods, the types of clothing, the DNA, the kind of knife used by butchers, the shape of the end of the oars of the Shikara boatman is a heart-shaped, the end of the paddle, which is the same as the ancient Hebrew oars. I remember being quite surprised when someone I know was actually hired by the Indian government to do research to try to explain why there are so many Hebrew names in India. First century AD Northern India was a vast center of not only Hinduism, but also Buddhism. The Israelites whom Jesus ministered to in these areas were a minority practicing Judaism. But it is very likely that many adopted the indigenous faiths of Hinduism and Buddhism also. It is possible to trace Jesus' footprints in these lands from some of these ancient texts. And these ancient books of Hindus are called Puranas. One book, Bhavishya Mahapurana, written in Sanskrit, contains an account of a king in India meeting Isa Masiha, Jesus the Messiah, a religious personality of fair complexion, who was a foreigner. Now, here is a document, Bhuvishya Mahapuran. This is the most important document. It, it says that Jesus comes to Kashmir. He meets the king Shalivahana about uh, 78 AD. And uh, he tells him that his name is Ishuruputram and Kanyagarbam, born of a virgin. And, and when was this document discovered? It's an ancient manuscript, and its date is 117. 117. Yes. So this is literally a, a second century document yes. which says that Jesus yes. was in Kashmir. Yes. Yes. That's, that's very early. That this was... is early. He means the king of Kashmir. This is the most important document. Can you tell me 
what Jesus did when he was here? What, what, what happened? You see, the, the first information what we get, mm -hmm. that he meets the, king. meets the king. And he explains to him how he fled away from the land of Malichas there and how he suffered there and how he came to this place and he stays here. Mm. When he stays here, here Persian sources and Arabic sources say that here he changed his name from Jesus to Yuzu. In the Valley of Kashmir, the Temple of Solomon contained an ancient stone inscription going back to 54 AD. The inscription said, that Yusasaf proclaimed his prophethood and that he was Yusu, prophet of the children of Israel. In modern times, the inscription was destroyed, but not before photographs were taken of it. Darin Wacht, Wacht means time in Persian. Darin Wacht, at this time, Yusasaf, uh, the um, uh, Jesus the Gatherer, Dawai Pagmambari Mikunand that he proclaimed his prophethood. And the other part, uh, he was Yusu, prophet of children of Israel. Aishan Yusu, Paihambari Bani Yisraelast. Buddhist texts contain a prophecy of future Buddha, a Bodhisattva named Bhagva Meteya. Gotama Buddha is to have prophesied, I am not the first Buddha to come upon earth, nor shall I be the last. Previously, there were many Buddhas who appeared in this world. In due time, another Buddha will arise in this world, a holy one, a supremely enlightened one, endowed with wisdom in auspicious conduct, knowing the universe, an incomparable leader of men, a master of devas and men. He will reveal to you the same eternal truths which I have taught you. He will proclaim a religious life holy, perfect, and pure such as I now proclaim. He will be known as Maitreya. Buddha also gave the time frame of when the Maitreya would appear, which would be around 500 years after his death, during the decline of his teachings. According to Buddhist tradition, during the arrival of Maitreya, bodies of water will decrease in size, allowing Maitreya to traverse them freely. In addition, at that time, a notable teaching he will start giving is that of the ten virtuous deeds, the abandonment of killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, divisive speech, abusive speech, idle speech, covetousness, harmful intent, and wrong views. The etymological resemblance of the word metheia to messiah is clear, and one meaning of the word messiah is traveler. In Jesus in India, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed writes, The future Mateya prophesied by the Buddha is in reality the Messiah and no one else. This view is supported by the strong evidence of Buddha's own prophecy that the faith he had founded would not endure in the world for more than 500 years. That at the time of the decline of the faith and its teachings, the Mateya would come to this land and re-establish the faith and its teachings in the world. Now we find that Jesus appeared 500 years after the Buddha, and that just as the Buddha had fixed the time frame for the decline of his faith, Buddhism did indeed deteriorate into a state of decadence as foretold. It was then that having escaped from the cross, Jesus traveled to those parts where the Buddhists recognized him readily and treated him with great reverence. As the sun of Christianity did rise in India with Jesus' personal advent in the area, many teachings of Jesus became interwoven with Gautama Buddha's teachings. Even certain parables as recorded in the New Testament became attributed to Buddha, such as the parable of the sower which is found in Buddhist texts. Jesus found acceptance in the lands of the lost tribes and completed his mission by traveling eastward to these ancient Israelite communities. One objection is, if Jesus spent most of his life in India, why is that part of his life so 
unknown and forgotten. One has to keep in mind the phenomenon of what happens to a religion's presence when another religion takes over. For instance, modern-day Afghanistan was a vast center of Buddhism and had some of the largest statues of Buddha in the world carved in stone. That faith has now vanished there. Another example are the pagan religions of Europe prior to Christianity's arrival. The Israelites people of Afghanistan and Kashmir accepted Islam. Jesus foretold the coming of a messenger after them, the paracleti of the Gospels, fulfilled in the person of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. With time, the old faith of Christianity was forgotten over generations. Now there are mainly Orthodox Muslims in these areas. However, remnants of the followers of Jesus still exist in the vicinity of Herat, Afghanistan. The British scholar O.M. Burke in his book Among the Dervishes has described these people. Though they are now Muslims, they did not forget their Christian legacy. They have a special attachment to Jesus and refer to him as Yuz Asaf the Kashmiri who came to preach to them. The Prophet Yuz Asaf came to Kashmir from the West, the Holy Land, around the 1st century AD. It is also where he died and lies buried in Sri Nagar, Kashmir. The burial place of Jesus in Kashmir is known to the locals as Rozabal, meaning the honored tomb. It is known as the tomb of Yuz Asaf which may be of Buddhist derivation or possibly from Yusu or Yehoshua, Jesus the Gatherer. The term would thus mean a Buddha who rallied people or gathered the flock of the true faith. Local tradition states that the entombed was a prophet of Ahle Kitab or the people of the book. The tomb is Jewish as attested by the direction that the grave is lying. Next to the grave is a footprint engraved in stone, an artistic rendition of the wounds of crucifixion. The inhabitant of that tomb is Yus Asaf, is the name given to us. Some researchers have said that this name is a translation of Jesus the Gatherer, and they believe Asaf means gatherer, so Jesus the Gatherer. Others have said it means the leader of the healed. We say Jesus, but in India and Pakistan and Kashmir and other parts of the world, he was always either called Isa or Yosasaf. After having lived there and, and breathed it for so long and, and absorbed it in every pore of my body for so long and researched it and seen it from that side of the world for so long, I have no doubt. No doubt is in my heart. That is Jesus in that tomb. The tomb of Yosasaf is hundreds of years older than the beginning of Islam. In the Muslim tradition, an enclosure building is never built around a tomb. But this tomb of Yuz Asaf has an enclosure building around the sarcophagus, around the grave, and that is an ancient building. One of the significant aspects of the tomb of Yuz Asaf, there is a carving of two stone feet the stone feet have strange marks, as though at the time of the burial, the artist was trying to show that that individual had undergone a crucifixion and to preserve that knowledge in stone. And of course, the Muslim caretakers now keep it covered over with a cloth because they do not want attention to be drawn to that fact. It took me personally about 20 years before I could uh, change my thinking and not be threatened by the possibility that Jesus uh, may have lived through the crucifixion and, uh, and recovered his health and lived a long life. But I do not think it is heresy asking the questions and seeing where the evidence leads. From Jesus' deliverance from death on the cross to his subsequent journey to India and ultimately his passing there, one question arises. What happened to the prophecies of his second coming? Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, author of Jesus in India, claimed to be that latter-day promised Messiah as prophesied in all major religions. Under divine guidance, he started the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in 1889. 
the community has now spread to 200 nations around the world with tens of millions of followers. This community, which is a revival movement of Islam, has a leadership or a caliphate which was established shortly after the demise of the founder. The current divinely appointed leader is Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed. And as stated by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, this sect of Islam has come into being for the spread of peace and harmony. To learn more about the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, please visit alislam.org. Check the links in the description below.